Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Sankalp, uh, and I take care of business development at PMS IIF World. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's call, and uh, you know, let's just give a little brief uh, background of what PMS IIF World does. Uh, we are one of the country's leading uh, digital age uh, wealth management and uh, distribution company. We uh, we we propagate or we are uh, you know we, we are supporters of informed investing and uh, those who are familiar with us and those who have attended our earlier calls will uh, testify that what we do uh, empowers the investors and we continue to strive to do so and in one such interesting conversation we have a very special guest with us uh, mr pratik oswal uh, let me just introduce uh, uh, mr oswal so he takes care of uh, passive funds at motila oswal asset management company uh, he is probably one of the only guys in the street today managing 11 passive funds uh, across uh, uh, across geographies, uh, predominantly US and India. Uh, so far, we have heard a lot about international investing and uh, you know how pa how passive funds can you know create a case for investors. And we have always observed that uh, in mutual funds, passive fund can be a good alternative uh, to your regular mutual funds. Uh, at the end of the day, most mutual funds are diversified products and an index makes equal, equally good sense. And uh, for more actively management products, people can look at PMS or AIS. So, uh, you know, I won't hold the stage for too long. Uh, I will hand it over to Mr. Roswal. And uh, let me just uh, leave you with this thought, Pratik. Uh, I just did a poll of uh, how many people have ever invested in national equities. In our audience, we have 36% uh, people who have invested and a 63% haven't. So I'm hoping uh, some of those people, and it's and it's a coincidence, 36 and 63. So I'm hoping we can, you know, convert some from the 63 to the 30s, uh, you know, to the, uh, you know, international investor kind of a uh, horizon. So what do you, Pratik? And, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, hear what you have to say. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Sankalp. And uh, good evening, everyone. You know, thank you for being here. And uh, thank you, Sankalp and uh, the team at PMSAI for having me out here. And uh, looking forward to this great conversation. You know, honestly, I think this 40, 45 percent is actually higher than I expected. You know, so from when I started last year, you know, selling international funds, it was more to do with zero percent. So I think it's very encouraging to see. I think the overall, I think, uh, participation of investors into international funds. I do think that we've only started, and uh, it, it's going to be a big segment in the next five or ten years' time. Uh, so let me start off with the presentation, you know, and thank you for the um, introduction as well. Uh, to give a more, I would say, um, more informal introduction, you know, I um, I spent the first half of my twenties in more. Uh, traditional finance, uh, investment banking, private equity, and then uh, spent the second half of my 20s in technology, worked for uh, technology startups in Silicon Valley, and then now I'm back here. Um, you know, I, I take care of all the passive funds at Mutla Loswal Asset Management Company, uh, and uh, we have now funds across all categories, uh, large cap, mid cap, small cap, multi cap uh, sector, and also international. Uh, so the whole idea behind this business is to actually provide building blocks for asset allocation to advisors such as yours. Um, when it comes to international investing, you know, so I used to be on the other side. Uh, I used to be an investment um, advisor in the U.S. and uh, I used to manage close to, uh, well, my team used to manage close to half a billion dollars in the U.S. And, you know, what I saw was almost all of them, you know, all, all my all my clients, in fact, you know, and all my clients for, say, 25 million plus in assets. All of them had between 20 to 40 percent allocation towards investments outside of the U.S. <clears throat> So, you know, as a concept, you know, international investing is not really uncommon. I saw a similar phenomena when I was in uh, London and also in Hong Kong. You know, so I do think that international investing is still very niche. But uh, I do think that over the next five to ten years time, you know, as per global standards, you know, most most investors here will have some allocation to international investing. So, you know, happy to uh, be a part of that with some of our funds uh, that we have. Um, so uh, in terms of my presentation, I'll keep it very short. Maybe maybe 20, 25 minutes max, and then maybe we can open it up for questions. Uh, I, I hope all of you can see the slides. Um, yes, yes, but, oh, yes, thanks. Um, so essentially, you know, I think, and this is, uh, I think more than how you invest, I think the more and most important, uh, I would say argument I'd like to make today is why you should invest, you know? So why is very important. I spend all my presentations about, you know, why you should invest and maybe five minutes talking about the products, which is somewhat similar to what I'll do today. So if you look at, uh, Investing in India today, 
you know india obviously is you know high growing country it's large it's uh, has great prospects going forward but if you look at india from a global landscape india is still only 3 and a half percent of global gdp market share you know so we're currently missing out on 96 97% of wealth creation opportunities outside of india and the us is actually a very obvious market because you have the world's one of the world's fastest growing countries india and then you have uh, the us which is also like the largest uh, i would say economy uh, and just by adding say a simple fund like an s&p 500 you know you are taking the 3 and a half percent and you are making it uh, almost 26 27% so you're capturing a lot more opportunities globally uh but the question remains you know why should you add this why should you bother because just because uh, you know i think uh, uh there are these external investments out there you know why should what is the impact that you can have on your portfolio you know because uh, why should you uh, diversify from a country that's growing at say 8 8.5% to a country that's growing at 2 2.5% let's let's find out uh the biggest reason is diversification you know so diversification is uh, i think slightly misunderstood as well um in india today so today if you look at diversification by putting your money across different mutual funds you know say if you put your money in say five different mutual funds and suppose all of them are equity funds that's actually not diversification because you know what we've seen is that you know regardless if you held a large cap fund or a mid cap fund or a multi cap fund you know everything goes up and goes down together which is what we saw in march and april as well so the correlation between equity in india and and this can be across different asset classes uh, not, not, not uh, across different funds uh, is close to 90% plus whereas if you look at international investing the correlation comes down to around 15 to 20% when the correlation of a nasdaq and an s&p is around 15 to 20% uh, and what that means is that you know these these things move in different directions you know so when the s&p goes up 10% the nifty may not and vice versa so what happens is when you're adding um, i would say an international fund in your portfolio you're making a portfolio less volatile and you're also giving the portfolio you know downside protection in case the indian markets do not perform so they are essentially uncorrelated assets which i think is an essential attribute for you to do good asset allocation uh that's one thing the second is that you know today all of our clients are talking about diversification and when you talk about diversification you know a lot of our clients are now adding debt adding gold adding adding say real estate the problem with those asset classes is that you know you are giving up a uh, return for lower risk you know essentially you know debt gold real estate has a lower return long term return as it's uh, compared to equity but international uh, investments is a category where you're not sacrificing return you know returns are pretty much the same in fact last 10 years returns have been a lot higher but risk is actually coming down dramatically you know so that's why i think you know it's a asset class which uh, gives you same amount of returns by lower risk which is why i think diversification opportunity is huge uh the second and this is also a very important reason is currency you know so when you're buying an international fund you're actually buying two asset classes not one you know one asset class you're buying is some of obviously some of the world's biggest businesses business models all of that you know great global businesses but the second asset class you're buying is the dollar and i do feel like the dollar today is a lot more important than the dollar used to be say um 5 or 10 years ago you know today all of us are doing a lot more foreign trips you know we are sending our kids to schools abroad and also the rupee has depreciated quite a bit in the last 10 years you know giving my own example you know i went to school in the us and when i went to uh, those US, us i used to play a pn exchange rate of 40 rupees 40 to 45 today it's close to 75 80 in fact if i go to the same school same degree you know i, I had to pay around two and a half three times than what i paid say in 2007 2008 so i do think that um, you know uh, international investments is one such category where you can also you know get exposure to dollar in addition to some of these global businesses and the rupee has lost close to five, maybe uh, i think around Four, five to five and a half percent over the last ten years, and three to three and a half percent in the last twenty years. So I think this can really help you get to the downside protection. Um, and and also I think you know today well seen as in dollar terms. You know no one calls Reliance a fourteen lakh crore company; they call it a two hundred billion dollar company. So I think the dollar access gives it uh, huge advantages going forward. Uh, so so and also I think what what will happen is the dollar will also um, you know add to your returns. you know so we have been running a nasdaq fund for close to 10 years now and uh, without uh, dollar returns uh, without the rupee depreciation the fund has done around 6 uh, maybe 5 5 and a half times but if you add dollar uh, appreciation then it's close to 8 and a half 9 times so that is the magic of uh, 
I would say, um, uh, investing in a depreciating, in appreciating asset. Uh, so that's uh, currency is important. The third is the quality of business models, uh, the businesses that you're buying. I think in these international funds, you know, as you can see, I think almost all, I would say, mutual funds uh, would have, say, uh, I don't know, like an HDFC bank or uh, an Infi or a Reliance in there. I think it's good to have some other companies as well who are almost as good or maybe better. You know, so the and these are not U.S. companies. These are global business models with you know operations all over the world, and they're all growing very quickly. So I do think that you know it adds an extra layer of diversification by giving you certain stocks and business models that you might that you use on a daily basis, but you might not have access to it, uh, you know, because you're sitting in India. Now, also, I think you know the competition landscape has changed a lot in India. You know, uh, today I think uh, back in the day, uh, Tata Motors used to compete with say uh, a Hyundai, uh, maybe a Maruti. Today you have Kia. Today you have Hyundai. You have Honda. So I do think that you know I think India has become a lot more international in terms of competition, and diversifying your money will also help you negate some of this local competition that we have today. So that's uh, I would say pretty much reasons to why you should invest internationally. You know, I think. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, there's a fourth reason as well, which uh, I think may, not many people talk about, but that's dividend yield. You know, so if you look at the dividend yields in the U.S., they are extremely high. Uh, for example, the S&P 500, the dividend yield is around two percent, which I think is really good. Uh, two percent uh, and two percent is higher than what you would get in India because developed is, developed countries tend to have higher dividend yields because their business models are a lot older and more mature. Uh, so and and two percent, you know, if you look at that uh, over the last thirty years. The S&P 500 without dividends did around uh, 14, 15 times. But if you add dividends, it's close to 26, 27 times. That is the magic of dividend compounding, something which will really add huge impact in your portfolio over the long term. So let's come to you know, some of the funds that we have in our in our international bucket. You know, so just quickly go through this. Uh, you know, happy to answer questions if any. And uh, these are not only sort of our funds, but also um, some of the very common funds that you see. You know, so this is uh, even if I wasn't talking about our own fund, I think S and P five hundred is pretty important. Um, it's it's typically I would say uh, the one fund, uh, the biggest mutual fund in the world. I would say, uh, in terms of managed by this singular index, you know, close to four trillion dollars, which is more than India's GDP. Uh, it's a fund that we launched around four months ago, and it's pretty much I would say a very simple fund. It's top five hundred companies in the U.S. It's like a Nifty hundred fund. You know, it captures eighty two to eighty five percent of the entire U.S. market cap in one fund. And it's a lot, it's a pure large cap fund, so you're not really getting any risk associated with smaller mid caps. Um, you know, it's uh, also a pretty, I would say, diversified fund. You know, it has diversified across all, um, I would say, sectors in the U.S. Uh, historically, it has a very, very good diversification. Lately, yes, technology has gone up, but historically, I think it's uh, one of the most diversified funds out there. Uh, uh, out there, and um, also, I think one very important point is, and this is something which I mentioned earlier. Is that uh, you know this is not a U.S. fund; it's a global fund. You know, in fact, we call it a world's large cap fund. You have close to 40 to 40 percent of the sales of this index coming from their operations globally. You know, so if you look at all these companies, Amazon, Google, Netflix, Spotify, they're all global businesses. So, in fact, uh, you know, you are actually buying global businesses through this fund, which I think gives you access to a lot more global diversification than you would have if you're buying specific, say, Japan or Europe or you know, Southeast Asia or something like that. So this is a very important part of uh, international investing, especially when it comes to U.S. because America tends to have the most global companies. So that's the S&P 500, very simple fund. Um, the next fund, and this is slightly more on the popular side, is the Nasdaq 100. The Nasdaq 100 is the top 100 uh, stocks that are that are listed on the Nasdaq exchange. Uh, in comparison to the S&P 500, the Nasdaq tends to be a little bit more tech heavy. Um, so if you see the uh, the, the sector weight, the Nasdaq tends to be high on technology, and consumer, and healthcare. Uh, most people call Nasdaq a tech tech uh, play, but it's actually not. It's only half the index is tech. The rest of it is actually pretty well um, divided into other sectors. Uh, the reason why the Nasdaq is also very popular is because not only does it have high growth uh, sort of sectors, it has zero percent to laggards. You no, know, I think this is what most people don't get. It has zero percent exposure to real estate, materials, energy, financials. Four of the worst, or utilities, four of the most, I would say, slow-moving sectors today, uh, which is also why the performance of the Nasdaq has been a lot better. However, it's also the most, uh, I would say, uh, concentrated index out there. You know, the top ten stocks are um, uh, essentially close to fifty-eight percent of the index, so it is uh, not as diversified um, in sector as well as stock in the S&P 500. 
let's look at the returns. Not very important, but uh, uh, this is also coming with a caveat. You know, returns have been phenomenally good for these two funds. And uh, just to put it out there, you know, there's the the, the probability of of uh, doing the same in the next ten years is quite low. So I do think that you know, return chasing when it comes to international funds will probably lead to disappointment for a lot of investors because Nasdaq has done close to twenty six percent in ten years, twenty percent in fifteen years, and close to twenty percent uh, for the S and P. So I do think that the future may not be as good as the past. You know, uh, I, 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 and and uh, we keep telling investors to keep to keep expectations low. Uh, and also, I think uh, what what I would suggest is to keep the same level of expectation that you could um, have on the Indian indices. So maybe the, the uh, maybe the returns would be the same, but I think the real reason to why you should buy this fund is to do with diversification, non-correlation, buying the dollar, and dividend yields. Those are a lot better reasons than uh, performance, which uh, has been quite great. Um, so that's pretty much those two funds, you know, um, that that we have, and also I think these two are also the most popular funds in the U.S. today. Uh, the reason why, you know, um, uh, passive funds is important when it comes to international investing, you know, I think uh, uh, when it comes to international investing, you know, at least in India, you know, I think active and passive both are doing well. But when it comes to say mature markets, just like the U.S. or Europe, you know, active obviously may not be the best choice because uh, the level of underperformance is actually quite high. And this has been consistent across, I would say, over a decade now. You know, in fact, S&P has outperformed 90 percent of all other funds in a 15 year category. And the Nasdaq has actually done better than the S&P. So I do feel that, you know, when it comes to at least international diversification, you know, we all know how difficult it is to find a fund manager in India. Finding one abroad is even harder. So I think uh, what the index does is you're making sure you're getting the highest performing product, you're saving fees. And you're making and you're buying something simple and something which you can hold for a very long time because the index obviously will not underperform. So um, that's uh, pretty much the funds that we have. Um, I would like to spend maybe five or ten minutes talking about uh, the U.S. economy. Uh, you know, this is also something that has been requested, uh, and then maybe we can open it up for questions. So quickly, just want to go through you know what is happening in the U.S. right now uh, because it's also a it's also uh, I think important for. I think investors out here as well. So, so I think the most important bit is uh, unemployment. You know, so I do feel that uh, unemployment is uh, quite high. It's still quite high. You know, in fact, most people don't know, but the unemployment, the peak of the unemployment in April has been the highest since 1947. Uh, so I do think that, and obviously it's come down to 10%. It's still quite high. It's uh, as it's higher than what we had in the peak of 2008 crisis. So unemployment is important because a lot of the policy decisions that the government takes is. To, to reduce unemployment, that's the number one factor that uh, really talks about the health health of the economy. So very important, uh, something to be monitored. Uh, obviously, you know why has the markets gone up? This is something which is not uh, uncommon. It's because of the heavy bond buying program or the liquidity uh, which has been flushed into the market by this by the Fed. So I do feel that uh, you know obviously this is something which is expected to be continue. Uh, so, to, so rates are going to be. Um, around 0% till at least 2022 early. So I think that's probably going to incentivize risk taking behavior, which is why people have locked two stocks. Uh, also a concerning fact is the jet, debt to GDP. You know, debt to GDP is very high in the US, highest ever since again, 1940s. Uh, but there are other countries that have much higher debt. So um, very hard to say what the long-term impact of the debt would be, but also something concerning when it comes to the US markets. Um, in terms of GDP, and this is something which uh, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, what's happening with the recovery? And recovery is expected to happen, go back to where it was uh, next year. So 2021, I would say middle of that is where people expect to go back to where there was. And uh, as you can see, India is also out here um, uh, when it comes to recovery. So I do think that, uh, you know, and this is obviously um, uh, taken into account that the vaccine will come into place hopefully early next year. Uh, so this is so hopefully you know we'll have uh, things go back to normal next year. Uh, this is a very important point. You know I keep uh, getting questions from investors asking if the economy is so bad, why should I invest now? And uh, you know just to put that in a philosophical context, um, equity and GDP are not correlated. You know so uh, equity markets tend to be forward looking, whereas GDP talks about what's happening right now. And uh, as even if you saw in 2008 crisis, the markets uh, recovered in 2009, but the, but the economy recovered in 2011. So equity markets tend to uh, be forward-looking. So they tend to expect a recovery and price themselves based on a recovery. 
uh, which is why i keep telling investors that you know if you wait for things to get better or things to go back to where it was then you probably missed out on the bus so i do think that investors shouldn't really wait for a recovery because markets obviously by the time the market recovers you know, the equity markets will be looking at something else in the future so i think that's very important um also i think you know if you look at performance of the s&p 500 um and this is over um i don't know like maybe 100 almost 100 years um you know as you can see the s&p 500 has gone through you know two a great depression two couple of world wars and oil crisis financial crisis all of that and still i think the core co- co- crisis may not be as significant as what most people feel so i do feel that you know it's obviously um, as you can see the last part of the graph that is the covid crisis the v shaped curve so i do think that uh, you know this situation may not be as bad as what the markets have done in the past this slide is important because it gives perspective towards long term investing which is uh, the only way of it um let's talk about valuations you know also very important uh, i would say point that people uh, ask me valuations are high you know relatively high when it comes to uh, historical but uh, as you can see you know i've put a backdrop of the index performance at the back and what that means is that you know if you see the valuation slide it's pretty much flat you know but if you look at the index performance it's uh, like a like a rising curve what that means is that you know whatever index performance has happened in the last 10 years has been only on the back of earnings not on the back of valuation expansion right now the the valuation is high because you know the because of covid you know uh, the earnings of companies are down by 30% but the stock prices are exactly where they are in february so at the third there is a 30% expansion valuation so i do think that you know that, uh, earnings has been extremely powerful for the us companies profitability is very strong so we can uh, i think the markets are expecting the earnings to catch up very soon to the current stock prices uh, earnings have been very powerful uh, and this is i visibly expectations you know so everybody expected gloom and doom uh in at least last quarter but we saw 80% of the companies posting better earnings than what analysts has expected before so i think um, yes you know people talk about doom and doom but if you look at the financials of companies uh, you know their uh, earnings have been positively better however earnings have been down 30% so obviously uh, compared to last year uh, earnings have been down 30% so just to something keep in mind you know when it comes to earnings Uh, when it comes to currency and currency is also very important because you know obviously when you are buying in international funds you are not only buying stocks but you are also buying the us dollar and what we've seen is that uh, you know as long as inflation in india uh, is higher than inflation in the us and this is economics 101 you know you will have a situation where the rupee will depreciate uh, i would say constantly over the long term uh, it's not stable it's not 3% every year it's pretty volatile but at least the average has been around 2 to 4% which is something that is prudent to expect in our investments as well uh what about elections you know elections is obviously around the corner uh, again a very common question that i keep getting asked and we've done the analysis you know we've studied the elections over the last 100 years and what we've seen is that uh, you know a typical election year uh, the s&p 500 is up 7% what we've also seen is that the typical election year the s&p 500 is a uh, non election year the s&p 500 is also up 7% so what we've seen is that you know i think economics and politics are not really that correlated there is not a lot of impact of uh, politics into companies the us tends to be a very hardcore capitalistic country and essentially the election is also funded by all of these fortune 500 companies so it makes sense that whoever comes into power you know needs to be in bed with the companies because that's where they get their election funding from so i do think that you know this is important uh, because uh, uh, yes you can expect heightened volatility but uh, i think saying that um, saying that um, uh, that it'll have an impact uh, may not be the most prudent thing to do so that's uh, pretty much i think the conclusion from the economy uh, you know as i said just to summarize you know unemployment rate is uh, high still quite high uh, but we and uh, money supply continues to be very high and uh, rates will be zero till 2022 uh, the pmi of us india uh, which is a leading indicator this is the manufacturing index uh, is actually shows a v v shaped recovery as we saw so uh, the manufacturing is back to pre covid levels at least in us and india uh, us and china india is still uh, unfortunately is not back to pre covid levels so that is a, a sort of a concern and obviously as you said as we said the us elections will not have a big impact and earnings has been uh, pretty good 
So that's uh, that's uh, basically our presentation. Uh, just wanted to highlight some of our funds that we have today in our stable. We are the only, uh, the largest managers of international funds uh, in India today, uh, MOMC. And uh, we also have funds across, uh, I think only ones that have funds across all categories. And we're also coming up with a debt ETF very soon. So, um, you know, so with that, you know, we'd like to uh, thank everyone and uh, maybe we can open it up for q and Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Pratik. So, uh, for some interesting insights, got some questions. So, before uh, you know, I take on with my first question. So, I think I, I, I did a poll which might be pretty interesting for you. Uh, you know, I asked investors on the call uh, whether international funds will be more than twenty percent of my portfolio in the next three to five years. Seventy-five uh, percent said yes. So, oh wow. Okay. So I think for good times. So. Uh, okay. First question that I will, uh, you know, put across to you, Pratik, is so a lot of investors uh, have asked me this, and in turn, I have asked this to a lot of managers. But I think you will give me some better insight uh, as you are managing uh, the passive investing part for one of India's largest uh, active fund management asset management company. So sitting yeah. at that vantage point, okay, can you just, uh, you know, just highlight on the call? For our investors, uh, what is the difference between the two? What is uh, what is it that investors investors should be mindful of, and what are the advantages or you know uh, you know I don't like to call disadvantages, but uh, what are some shortcomings of uh, either of the two? So you know quickly or you know we can spend five to ten minutes on that, and maybe uh, because this is a very pertinent question and uh, often a very uh, repeated question. Over to yeah. you. So, um, I'm, so basically, when it comes to I think investment management, you know, so there are obviously two forms of investing: passive and active. Uh, and and uh, I think if you wanted to define the two, one is obviously manager driven. So you have a fund manager and he goes out there, he or she goes out there and you know, takes a call or two which stock to buy and sell. And passive investing is or is basically buying a particular index like the Nifty or the Sensex. And uh, when it comes to you know active versus passive, we think passive stands for simplicity more than anything else. You know, I think it's a very today. I'll be honest. You know, the reason why we started this, in fact, is nothing to do with performance. It's to do with choice. You know, we I think uh, today at least a lot of retail investors you know have a lot of choice. You know, five thousand mutual funds out there. You know, so many ETFs, PFS, a lot of acronyms in the industry. And I do feel that passive funds offer a huge level of simplicity for the customer today. Uh, without really being worried about performance, you know. So I think that is what uh, I think the I would say the, uh, the the thesis behind you know why we started this 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 business um, after being one of the largest active managers, which we still are. I think that's still our core business, and that's something which we're doing extremely well. And uh, I mean, most of our funds also are performing over a long term perspective. So I think uh, core skills is, is still I would say you know active investing is just that passive offers a lot of simplicity to a customer. You know, I think if you asked uh, Dal Oswal AMC uh, ten years ago, you know, when we started the AMC, they were like, "Are you guys are brokers? Why are you guys starting in the AMC?" You know, today I think people ask us, "You guys are active managers. What are you guys doing passive?" I think a tagline is "Think, think equity, think Dal Oswal." You know, so equity is obviously all income, income, income passing, and uh, I do think that passive will play a major role in the future. So, which is why I think you know. Uh, we really are focused on this approach to building, a, I would say, a business around passes, which I think is also something which is gaining a lot of ground. And I do feel that it offers a huge level of simplicity for at least a non-sophisticated investor. About that. Right. So, uh, you know, from your call, I gathered, uh, apart from just a geographic diversification, U.S. equities uh, also offer the dividend yield and some kind of uh, windfall gains due to the currency. And, uh, you know, the economics of both the countries is such place that the U.S. dollar will always be relatively more expensive compared to the Indian rupee. I get that. So, uh, you know, this question is something that uh, I got as a message during the call is that today we see a lot of the Indian companies going global. You know, when I say uh, a lot of Africa is uh, served by telecom giants like Bharti Airtel from India. A lot of uh, Mahindra exports a lot of vehicles to there. So these are just cases in point. Consultancy, uh, sorry, uh, IT consultancy and, uh, you know, pharma are already big examples of uh, Indian spread across the world. So from that perspective, when you feel that, uh, do you feel that Indian business is going global? 
provides investors uh, domestic investors that exposure automatically or should they uh, go out there and exclusively buy some uh, us stocks so i mean what's uh, how will it uh, affect the indian investor in either way yeah it's a good question you know so i think uh, i actually don't think so you know i don't think indian businesses have gone abroad unfortunately in spite of you know having um, i would say the rupee uh, depreciating over the last 10 years you know we in fact haven't really uh, our exports have been quite poor you know in spite of uh, so we had an opportunity in the last 10 years to actually go out there and you know build out our exports in it as well as i would say manufacturing and we've sort of given it to china and other countries and so on. so i think i i do think that you know we haven't been opportunistic as a country to go abroad as much in fact what you see today is the opposite you have global companies you know who are being a lot more opportunistic about investing in india and we have been going global so i do think that uh, there has been uh, it is in my in my opinion from what i've seen you know i uh, interact with a lot more global companies today than indian companies if you look at my the, the where i spend my time and my money so i think uh, you know it's actually the uh, yes you know i think if you do invest in say it companies then obviously most of their uh, customers are abroad uh, but uh, you haven't really seen them open up offices in other parts of the world so i think it's more services uh, so so so, so uh, just to keep it short uh, i don't think indian companies are as global as what most people think and if you look at the pnl balance sheets their share of global revenue is quite minuscule compared to their local or indian revenue so i think the only way you can diversify your investments is to actually go in there and buy uh, global companies yes india will hopefully be a lot more global in 10 years time but i think your portfolio needs to be global today or at least in the next one or two years time and waiting for indian companies to global you know might be a bit too late so i think you know it, it's an allocation decision more than anything else um, also the reason why you know you should not expect or uh, or um, look at indian companies going global is because ultimately you're buying stock in the us you know so the correlation as i pointed out is the one of the most important reasons for you to diversify internationally you know it's an uncorrelated asset whereas if you're looking at indian companies going abroad yes their financials will be impacted but ultimately you're still buying in in inr um, and you're buying indian asset which you already have so i think uh, you know if you look at it from a diversification point of view uh, yes you know your portfolio is growing global slightly but uh, i think for you to have a 15 20% allocation towards international uh you should ideally go there and buy global companies because you know a lot of our time and effort and uh, spending is happening in these countries and also obviously the dollars become a lot more important today right 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 thank you that's what quite in, quite insightful because in my mind and you know when i discuss investments with my family you know this has always come up ki bahar kyu jana hai bhai hamare company se bahar ja rahe so that's good insight uh, so essentially a lot of indian companies are not uh, doing business uh, you know abroad as much they should have been given the yeah. opportunity yeah okay so we'll take another interesting question this is actually from an investor that i have got uh indian large caps are typically the more conservative ones that they have churned out cash over the years of operation and you know they've been doing well they have internal accruals you know some of these large cap companies have so much cash in the balance sheet and often uh you know don't uh, they stray away from borrowing and are conservative in terms whereas uh, the average uh, or the new age us tech driven business at least has a flair for taking risk and you know they they try to you know sometimes leverage their books or uh, go aggressive on business calls so how do you see that as a I maybe mean, that's a contrast from the normal indian large caps you know like tesla i, I think tesla is yet a few miles to go before it turns a full uh, year of profits or uh, you know there there are very various other uh, new age us companies like that for instance how do you see that as an invest indian investor who's used to these conservative ways of business uh, isn't that a contrast somewhere no so i would again disagree with you <laughs> you know so i think uh, i think if you look at the profitability and the, the amount of cash that all these at least top so you're essentially investing in top 50 companies uh, because mm-hmm. that's the way the index is structured and if you look at the balance sheets they are flushed with cash you know they are taking the more i mean if you look at all these tech companies google apple facebook you know they have like hundreds of billions of dollars in cash they have no idea what to do with so much cash you know the biggest was because hedge fund is apple um who is having more than 500 billion dollars so i i think it's the opposite in fact the problem is they don't know what to do with so much cash right. you know and now the issue is leverage is not really a big issue because your interest rates are 0% out there so you can infinitely refinance yourself without even worrying at least for the next one or two years time in fact you know apple despite of having i don't know 4 300 400 billion dollars in cash 
they are going out there in the market and raising more debt just to and because they're getting 30 year money and 0% so they're just borrowing it because it's free of cost so i think it's the opposite you know i think uh, yes indian companies are very conservative but i think uh, the problem is not uh, being aggressive the problem is that they are just minting so much money that they really don't know how to reinvest it and technology companies tend to be a uh, very high cash flow and the only operating expense tends to be i would say people yes tesla i agree i think tesla is a one good example of over leverage but even they have seemed to come out of it now because uh, they are cash flow positive uh, as well as pnl positive so i think there are certain companies that yes did go through uh, uh, these things um, i would say the biggest problem in leverage comes on to the manufacturing uh, the airlines um, the i would say the construction and the real estate utilities I th- and um, I think those are areas where I think uh, you would not see a big impact because of zero percent interest rate. Uh, they at least won't go bankrupt. You know, they might uh, leverage up more than that, but they won't go bankrupt. So I think if you look at the top companies, thirty, forty, fifty companies, you see that all of them are I think pretty conservative. You know, look at Boksha Hathaway. You know, they're, they're the highest net worth country in the world right now. So the highest net worth countries like companies. So I think um, I don't think. Uh, in, in fact, you know, there's been um, I would say flash. Uh, there, there's been, uh, I would say, com- not complaints, but there have been a lot of consumer, uh, I would say, uh, or sophisticated investors who are telling that, no, why aren't you taking more risk? Why aren't you investing this $100 billion in, say, you know, clean, clean tech or something like that? And they've just been very conservative. So I think it's, it's not that, you know, I, I don't think that uh, leverage is a big problem, at least in the U.S. companies. Um, yeah, and it, it may be an industry issue, but if you look at the top guys, they're very comfortable. Right, right. Thank you. So again, another myth burst on the call. So uh, now I have a technical question for you. Yeah. Uh, a few people have asked, uh, you know, on this call. So one is on the capital gains, uh, capital gains taxes uh, for investors investing from India to there. And the other uh, question that I think is also very pertinent is, uh, what is the difference if I invest in a passive fund, let's say, uh, like yours, in a mutual fund in India, or I invest using the LRS scheme and buy buy my equities uh out there in america so what is the difference and on the uh, taxation bit so if yeah you could just yeah some yeah so in terms of taxation you know um um this as per income tax laws and also as per SEBI regulation all international funds are taxed as debt you know so debt taxation will also apply to your mutual fund investments in india whether is it through mutual funds or lrs both are the same thing uh so it'll be around uh, the tax lab whatever it is 20 30 percent and but if you invest for three years and above then you can claim indexation benefits. Basically, what that means is that you can readjust your purchase price by inflation. So uh, post three years, you can expect to pay the same uh, tax as what you would pay in equity uh, in terms of long term gains capital. So I think that's pretty much the tax in terms of the capital gains in the US. You know, there is no capital gains on there because obviously uh, you will just be uh, so the fund today. So as we are investing in US stocks, we are not subject to capital gains as an AMC. So only the, it's only happens at the investor level not at the fund level. So that's on the capital gains tax. Um, uh, the second one, the second question I think you asked about is, uh, sorry. About uh, just, using LRS to invest in uh, LRS, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, so both are, yeah, so, yeah, so both are actually very good options, you know, depending on what you want. The LRS, uh, today it's slightly on the expensive side. You're looking at uh, close to three to 4% uh, in, in expenses when you're, you know, opening a broking account, you know, there are, there are there's around two, two and a half percent of currency conversion charges, all of that. So I think the LRS, if you can negotiate your pay, price to uh, a very less, uh, which I know some people are doing it, then obviously it makes sense. Um, otherwise, you have to really think long term, you know, uh, sending your money out for, say, five, six, seven years for you to make sure that um, uh, that, that amount transferred is, is a lot. Uh, I, I do think that uh, LRS is good because it gives you a lot more options today. Uh, see, uh, I mean, if you want to invest from India today, the, the mutual fund landscape gives you maybe maybe 30, 40 choices. But if you're looking for a lot more exotic products, if you're looking for a lot more, I think, custom products or whatever it is in hedge funds, then the LRS uh, route might make more sense. In, in But also, I think there's a cap on LRS. So there's a 250K cap for every investor. There's also a 5% uh, TCS charge, which you can claim back. Uh, so I think uh, so, so 5% of your money will be kept aside um, and which you have to claim back in income tax. So I think those are some of the hurdles of LRS is administrative and all that. Uh, but I, but obviously, I think if you do LRS, then funds are a lot cheaper in the U.S. than buying it out here. So buying an S&P 500 with the Motla Roswal is more expensive than maybe buying it from Vanguard on the U.S. 
but you have to cross this administrative hurdle, which I think uh, may make sense if you're looking from a long term perspective, if you're willing to uh, do all that. But otherwise, if you want something simple, then you can just invest with uh, the funds out here. Right, right. Point well taken. Uh, so I'll just ask in a quick question since you have been uh, taking care of uh, the uh, the passive part at Motilal Loswal AMC. Uh, do, you, do we see any of uh, such uh, passive strategies coming on the PMS and AIF platform anytime soon? Uh, yes, we're working on it. So working on something uh, not anytime soon. You know, I think um, PMS AIF tends to be uh, I think we're trying to uh, learn a lot about, uh, at least for me, I'm, I'm, I think PMS is uh, today are, are looked at as, as a stock picking platform, but uh, I do feel that the AIF category is where we can actually uh, use options as well. So, uh, in fact, my previous company, uh, we used to do something called option overlays, where we combined a, a long only uh, index fund which, uh, with a downside protection strategy. It's extremely popular. Uh, almost every ultra HNI has that in his portfolio. So we're trying to do something similar to that. So maybe maybe early next year, but uh, yeah, we're working on something. Right. So now we'll address the elephant in the room about the extremely high allocation to tech in a lot of these, uh, you know, US centric funds or uh, US based in indices. So how how do you look at that? Uh, any perspectives on that? Yeah. So you know. Um, I think there's there's two things. Uh, one is more of a philosophical thing. One is more of a rational thing. I think right. rationally, I agree. You know, tech exposure is relatively on the higher side, um, uh, and uh, there is a fair bit of concentration. I think more than tech, it's the size concentration. The top five companies are just so. I mean, they're so damn big. You know, so I think uh, that is the bigger risk out there than actually sector uh, sector calls because. I do think that you know sector is something which is going to die in 10 years time. You know, every company will become a tech company in 10 years time. Otherwise, they may not be able to survive. In fact, what uh, the gigs? Uh, so we have something called gigs uh, sectors. And in fact, you know you will be surprised. But Amazon is not a part of technology. Facebook is not part of technology. Facebook is down to telecommunications. I think uh, Apple also. Warren Buffett calls him a consumer play, but you know I think Gigs calls it a technology company. So I think in, in India, you know, Reliance. I don't know if it's a retail company or a telecom or a retail company. So I think uh, or oil and gas. You know, I think uh, my opinion is that you know sector investing is probably not going to work out the way it has in the past because you know se sectors are merging. I think uh, so. I do think that uh, you know yes, uh, there is concentration in tech, but I would be slightly higher, slightly more worried about the concentration in number of companies. You know, so the Nasdaq more than its exposure to tech, it's uh, more the, the more risky thing is that the top ten stocks are fifty eight percent of the index. You know, so you're essentially you know buying twenty twenty five companies out of the Nasdaq hundred companies. So I think you really need to bet on these companies. But obviously, if you want something a lot more diversified, something more long term, then you have the S and P five hundred, where the top ten companies are around twenty five twenty six percent. So it's a lot more diversified than the Nasdaq. Uh, but obviously, I think everyone wants to buy Fang stocks today. Right, right, right. So it's interesting to know that Facebook is no longer a tech stock, but a telecommunication stock. Yeah, I, it, it beats me. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I, I think there's a few other examples of that. Um, even uh, I think uh, there's a few other technology companies that started off as tech companies, but then now they've created these. Uh, I think they created something called telecommunications, where a lot of these companies are now being held to show diversification. So it's becoming more interdisciplinary now. But I take your point with the example of Reliance there. So it still has major revenues coming from uh, Petrochem, but it's being valued as a more consumer or tech centric company. Uh, understandable. So at the at the risk of digressing a bit, uh, you know, I will request you to spend five minutes on your India focused passive funds because uh, you know you've got you've got some interesting structure there. Also, I saw on your slide you've got Bank Nifty, Nifty Five Hundred. These are essentially uh, very very interesting kind of uh, funds. So we'll just spend a little time because our whole uh, construct today is about U.S. and international investing. Uh, so yeah, over to you. Yeah, sure. So uh, domestic piece is very interesting, you know. So um, um, so we have uh, very simple products, you know. So I think what I've learned is that simple products end up being very, I would say, effective at least for part of your core portfolio, you know. So there's something on core and satellite, and core essentially should be you know very simple products to do simple things. Uh, so if you look at all our passive funds, you know, it's pretty much very simple. You know, we have um, seven domestic funds today and um, um, I would say all are I think, in different categories. So we have two large cap funds, Nifty 50 and X50, very simple. We have a mid cap index 
which the entire mid cap uh, index so uh, mid cap 150 so where you can play where around 100% of your money will be uh, invested in mid cap and also we have a small cap 250 fund uh, which plays into the top to fees top to 50 small cap funds then we also have a multi cap fund which uh, which i think eventually will become the only pure multi cap fund from the regulations perspective because obviously it's an index you can't really change the structure of the fund but it's essentially uh, it's actually an all market fund uh, it captures close to 96 97% of the fund um, you know vanguard in fact vanguard which is the world's biggest uh, passive uh, i would say amc you know their biggest fund is a total market fund so this nifty 500 was um, built to replicate the total market so if you had to just invest in one fund i think this fund would be sufficient for an investor so i think that's typically how we uh, built out our product bouquet you know the idea behind this was to build building blocks for asset allocation you know we do feel that asset allocation is probably uh, become the gold standard now from what we've learned i think market timing is something that doesn't really work out well for most investors so might as well have your money spread across asset classes so i think we think that someone who wants to buy wants to just put in a small cap fund or a mid cap fund instead of him or her it's, it, it, essentially if you're not really um, i would say ha- have access to excellent advisory you can just plug in a mid cap 150 fund and i think performance is pretty much uh, 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 pretty much the same and you're actually getting something which is a lot more pure play so i think that's that's a thinking behind you know setting up this passive business um you know obviously the domestic side is has 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 been growing steadily but the success that we've had is mostly on the international segment because i think that is now i think the current flavor of the market uh, but i do feel that you know i think um, our focus in simple products will eventually i think uh, Uh, do well because uh, i think what at least i have learned is that you know even big offices in the us you know have around 40 to 50% allocation towards uh, some of these simple products which have worked well in the past right right keep it simple silly it seems sorry so, i said keep it silly uh, keep it simple yeah. silly it seems yeah so uh, we will take uh, some perspective yeah. from you on asset allocation since you mentioned it uh, what do you think is a good allocation or what should be an optimal allocation from a moderate for a moderately uh, you know risk uh, taking indian indian investors investor towards global equities and uh, club that question with another uh, part which is apart from the us do you see any pockets of opportunities across the world maybe japan maybe uh, maybe europe uh, or latam so uh, yeah yeah so um in terms of asset allocation you know i um i would recommend a minimum of 50 to 20% of your overall equity allocation uh the reason why i say is because if someone has only 2% or 3% or 4% allocation towards internationals then it's just some other fund in your portfolio it doesn't really matter you know it's some small fund uh, but if you want that diversification low correlation lower volatility in your portfolio then it needs to be an allocation decision not a really a fund selection decision so i do feel that everyone who is investing in fact everyone you know should have between i think 15 20% minimum uh when it comes to international investments and i think us can be the first geography that you can look at uh in terms of other geographies you know um unfortunately no one's looking at other geographies everyone's only looking at the us but uh, you know you should ideally look at other ge- geographies as well um i think just because us is performing doesn't mean other markets are poor honestly no one can really predict the next 5 10 years so i do think that uh, you know you should i think investors who are looking at diversification should ideally look at say um japan and uh, europe which have some really amazing companies you have emerging markets such as china taiwan brazil which is also could be hot spots of growth over the next 5 10 years time so i do feel that you know the themes um, should be um, i think uh, more than just us um uh, when it comes to international investing if you had to decide how to allocate this um uh, what i would uh, a simple way of allocating this money is to uh, look at the overall market share uh, of the market cap so the us tends to be around uh, 55 to 60% of global market cap so maybe if you're looking at investing 100 rupees you can look at you can look and look at maybe investing 60 in 100 a uh, 60 in the us and the balance 40 can be allocated across a uh, different geography so that's a maybe very easy framework for you to allocate your money abroad sure sure so uh, you know uh, one of our investor friends uh, has this question is it a good time uh, a good time to enter tech ark ark tech ets targeted on us markets given the us elections so i'm guessing ark is a certain kind of uh, stock uh, 
No, uh, ARK, is, yeah, ARK is now become a big deal now in the US. Uh, they are, mm-hmm. uh, they have, uh, they were the first ones to call, um, have a, they, so they actually benefit because they're a huge call on Tesla. And um, they've actually done, in fact, the highest holding is a Tesla. And this was, I think, last uh, 10 months. So, and now it's obviously a very high profile fund. Uh, the, the the fund manager for ARK has now become a very, very big deal in the US. And uh, ARK has now become a big deal in tech investing. Uh, so yes, you know, I think um, I, I would say that, you know, yes, you can look at ARK for your technology investments because uh, I think the ARK is more to do with, uh, because the index tend to be top heavy, you know, so whichever the big company is, that'll get more weightage and small companies will get lower weightage. But when it comes to say active fund management, you know, you obviously have, if you have insight about industry, then you can actually go out there and buy future winners. Uh, so yes, you know, you can look at ARK, it's just that, uh, you know, um, if you look at thematic or sector investing over a very long time period, uh, more money is lost in sector funds than gained in sector funds because you know interest in sectors funds happens ha- absolutely at the peak. You know, so pharma, pharma, pharma NFOs in 2018, infrastructure NFOs in 2005, 2006. So I feel uh, you know I think uh, there's a lot of uh, interest that comes. So sector funds require some element of market timing uh, as opposed to which is why I think the best uh, I would say dis- best vehicle for investment tends to be diversified into funds because you don't have to care you know the nifty used to be uh, oil and gas industrial say 15 years ago today it's financial services tomorrow it might be something else so you don't have to worry as long as you have a diversified portfolio because it self rebalances each other over long time periods uh, but when it comes to sector investing you know it tends to go up and also go down because you know i think um, uh, it tends to be most popular when everyone's talking about it and that's when values are so as I get it, ARK is more of something like buying a real estate or a pharma focused fund. It's uh, a tech, it's, yeah, it's a tech focused uh, active fund. So okay. I actually really like them to be honest. So a small allocation makes sense um, uh, to ARK because I think they are they're actually quite credible. And the best part about ARK is that research is completely open out of the public. So it's not like a very like, you know, like very jarred or they, it, they like, uh, put their research to themselves, they actually tell you that this is our thesis, you can read it. If you like us, you can invest in our company. So that's a really uh, very interesting way of pitching uh, right. pitching uh, a fund to the public is to just open source your research and let people decide. Right. So uh, how I understand is uh, this is something that I also got to do mm-hmm. on the call today, the ARK is a more uh, upcoming and uh, tech oriented yeah. fund. Nice. So we'll take the last question. Actually, this is a, very, this is a personal question not from the audience. I understand that uh, you are, uh, you know, uh, spending a time in Goa now. And uh, the question that I want to ask in the interest of all here is how do you view the world opening up or in a post COVID world where, you know, people have started to take flights again, you know, go out and have a, have a coffee or a drink. Maybe how do you view this? And, uh, you know, are you, are you concerned that people are not spending enough or, you know, how do you how do you view the uh, post COVID world? And we close with that. Yeah, I think uh, post COVID world. Um, I think it's very. Um, I think a lot depends on this vaccination, you know. So, so my wife is an immunologist, and, uh, mm-hmm. and she's actually gone oh, out there and worked in labs, and she's seen cells grow and all of that. And uh, you know, so I think she's a little bit more pessimistic about this vaccination because she's worked in a lab and she's seen it happen. Uh, so I think uh, it, uh, a lot depends on how uh, this entire vaccination thing happens over the next say, 12 to 18 months time. And uh, and if obviously there is and obviously, I mean, once the vaccination to come and the other thing has to go out there and vaccinate a billion people or seven billion you know, people in the world. So I think that is a huge project management uh, sort of uh, problem, uh, which hopefully I think if, if you know countries sort of work together, then we should be good to go. But I do think that, you know, I think um, uh, uh, you know, I, it, it is going to be, um, I would say, a lot more difficult than what most people feel today, uh, coming from a scientist's point of view. Um, the other thing is that, you know, humans tend to be very adaptable. You know, that's what I really like. You know, I think, uh, obviously, I, and, and I do think that we've adapted really well. And uh, if you look at, uh, you know, businesses are uh, flourishing despite all of all this. Uh, so I do think that, you know, yes, the, uh, in one way, I think, uh, you know, it could be an opportunity for India a lot because, you know, I used to hire people in San Francisco uh, and out of college, I used to pay them $150,000 plus equity. And, you know, you can find someone with uh, a lot more zeal, enthusiasm in India at maybe one fifth the cost. So I do think that, you know, I mean, you could have a lot more opportunity in India than what, what most people think in the employment space uh, on the uh, at least on the uh, and 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 because of that, I think it 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 could be a bit of a game changer for at least for India uh, on the and the employment aspect. 
but uh, in the post covid world honestly uh, you know it is going to be uh, pretty much in a staggered way you know I, I, as you know i think we thought europe was out of it but uh, again cases have crept up a lot in fact they've gone to all time highs again in europe so you know unless we have a full a long term solution it's very hard for you to see what the future is looking like right right so we had a very insightful call i personally enjoyed myself a lot so to summarize uh, you know you can correct me if i if i stray so a uh, us or international investing is a good tool for diversification uh, while your core focus or your money will be created with active fund management but a uh, us uh, or global diversification offers a lot of perspective and a lot of advantages like uh, dividend uh, and currency gains one of them uh, you know uh, 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 you know, uh, like we we will we will uh, we also looked at a few myths about about the U.S. Uh, you know, heavy heavy tech based invest uh, indices, where uh, we understood that these are not typically tech companies, but they are more interdisciplinary in nature. And you know, going ahead, most companies will be tech companies, so that is not how you should view them. Uh, and uh, you know, represent a good opportunity for investors here. so thank you prateek so uh, you know for being on the call i i hope to see you uh, soon again on a uh, few more such calls and maybe next time we can talk about india focus etfs or something like that and uh, it, it's been an absolute pleasure thank you audience thank you for being with us today i uh, hope you enjoyed the call as well yeah thank you thank you sankal thank you everyone for having me out here and uh, look forward to more interaction with uh, with, with all of you thank you so much thank you